Blessed is the one who finds wisdom and the one who gets understanding. For the gain from her is better than the gain from silver and her profit better than gold. She is more precious than jewels and nothing you desire can compare with her. Long life is in her right hand. In her left hand are riches and honor. Her ways are ways of pleasantness and all her paths are peace. She is a tree of life to those who lay hold of her. Those who hold her fast are called blessed. morning church family. If you will please open your Bibles with me to the book of Proverbs. I'd like to thank Ayadel Pompey, Paul Morris, Reverend Adolph Davis for preaching in my absence. They all did a phenomenal job. Let's give them a good round of applause. I would like to wish all of the Fathers in the house and those of you joining us online, uh, happy Father's Day. Uh, This morning we're starting a new series titled The Summer of Wisdom. And uh, over the next seven weeks or so, we are going to study the book of Proverbs to help us to understand the difference between knowledge and wisdom. And you're not going to want to miss any of these weeks because I I think God's going to really speak to us. He's going to do some things in our hearts and lives. And so if you're traveling, please make sure that you watch us online. But if you're home, I also want you to make sure that you are here with us in person. Let me begin with this. Seven things your dad said That you said that you will never say. Are you ready? All right. Number seven. If so and so jumped off of a bridge. Would you jump off of the bridge too? How many of you heard that one? Money doesn't grow on trees. Money doesn't grow on trees. We'll cross that bridge. When we come to it. All right. Here is number four. When I was your age, I had to, you want to hear mine? Sweep the yard. Go drug water. Make my breakfast. Clean my room. Make my bed all before I go to school. All you need to do is to get ready to go to school and you can't be on time. That was my reality. All right. This one, if you've been around our church for any time, you would have heard this repeated over and over again. Do what you're told. Do it immediately. And do it with a good attitude. Number two. Stop crying. Or I will give you something to cry about. How when you get licks? And then the famous one. Why do I have to do that? Because I said so. Well, I, I've got to be honest with you, right? Um, I have had those things said to me, said to me, and I have said them to my children numerous times. And I'm sure some of you would have to, right? But let me ask you this. Let me ask you this as we begin to interact with God's word today. If you're a dad, what are you passing down to your children? If you're a parent, what should you be passing down to your children? If you are an adult, what can you be passing down to the next generation? And that's what I want to talk to you about. So open your Bibles with me 
to Proverbs chapter 22 and verse 6. Our ushers have some Bibles. They'll be willing to get one into your hand. If you don't have it, you're going to want to interact with God's word today. Proverbs chapter 22 and verse 6. Just wave in the direction of our ushers and they'll get a Bible into your hands. The title of the message is The Wise Pass Down Their Wisdom. That's the title of the message. The Wise Pass Down Their Wisdom. And I want to share with you this morning, loved ones, five divine deposits that we all need to make in the next generation. Especially if you are a dad. Especially if you are a parent. Because this verse was written specifically to you. But even if you are not a parent, we all have a responsibility to make deposits in the next generation. You've heard it said, you've heard it said, it takes a village to raise a child. Turn to the person next to you and tell them, I am the village. Turn to the person next to you and just say to them, you are the village. So it includes all of us. It's true. And let me read for you what Proverbs chapter 22 verse 6 says. And I want to, do, to read this from different translations so that it sinks in, so that you can get it. It says, train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. The New Living Translation says, direct your children onto the right path. And when they are older, they will not leave it. The message says, point your kids in the right direction. When they're old, they won't be lost. So if you're a note taker, write down the first divine deposit that we all need to make in the next generation. And here it is. Depos deposit godly wisdom in the next generation. That's what train up a child means. The Hebrew word train is only used five times in the Old Testament. And loved ones, four out of the five times it's used to dedicate a house or to dedicate a temple. That's what it literally means. To dedicate, or the, the biblical word is to consecrate something. It comes from the root word in the Hebrew, Hanukkah, which speaks of the dedication of an altar or when the walls of Jerusalem was being dedicated. I remember when Debbie and I dedicated each of our two children to the Lord. We were making a commitment publicly to raise them in the grace, in the strength, in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. It was an admission that we needed God's guidance and help to do it. That's what parent-child dedications are all about. They are twofold. Parents are making a commitment to raise their children in the grace, strength, and knowledge of the Lord. And we as a church are coming alongside them and helping them in that process. That's what it's all about. And that's what our children and student ministries here at High Point are all about. It is, we, to, it is to come alongside the parents. It is to help them to fulfill their mutual vision of growth in Christ. That's what we're after. I'm so thankful for the many young adults who presently are doing this for all of our children. They affirm what we are trying to teach in different but relevant ways and voices that our children would listen to. So parents, take advantage of our children's ministry. It is not babysitting up there. You understand what I'm saying? Our children's ministry is not designed to babysit. Our children's ministry, even, listen, the babies, we pray over them. We love them. We, we care for them. We, 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 we sing songs to them. We read scripture to them. It's not babysitting. It is from a very young age to get God's word into their lives. That's what our children's ministry is about. If you have never gone up there, you should take a walk up there and check it out. It is off the hook. And then our student ministries, parents, take advantage of our student ministry, High Point students. We have, we have 30 to 50 students that come here on a Saturday afternoon and we pour into them. Do you understand? 
Listen, sometimes the voices that they hear are from their peers in school, but we are depositing godly wisdom here at church into them. You may say, well, it's a Saturday afternoon. Yeah, but there are others where. So, so listen, take advantage of it. It's here for you, parents. Now, the word Hebrew, in the Hebrew, to train, and I love this one, also means to set aside, to narrow, to hedge in. And that's what we need to do with our children too. We need to narrow their focus and hedge them in so that they know what boundaries are and how to develop and grow. Are you following that? I think of what's happening in our society. And listen, this, this breaks my heart, eh? How our women are sexualized and demeaned. And it isn't good because it will manifest itself in different ways when these children grow up to become adults. We hear it in the songs that are sung. We see it on display in our homes. Our sons looking the, at the way that their mothers are treated. And when they grow up, what do you think they're going to do with the women in their lives? It breaks my heart. Because listen, it starts in the home. I was taught at a very young age that you treat women with respect. If I was ever disrespectful to my mother, oh boy, watch out. I was taught when I was in Boy Scouts how to treat a lady. And listen, I had an opportunity to pour into our students. They thought I was a bit crazy. They would remember this. I was leading the student ministries when Pastor Junior was on sabbatical. Every opportunity I get, I got them when the girls came. I said, girls stand, boys, you come out here. Go and pull out the chair for them to sit down. They watch me like I was crazy. I said, listen, you learn to treat them well. You learn to respect them. Speak to them kindly. And it starts in the homes and it, with dads modeling it with the mothers of their children. Treat her like a gentleman. Avoid losing your temper around her. Don't treat her as a doormat. Surprise and challenge her. Compliment her wisely. Consider her needs for a moment. Protect her. I'm teaching my son this. You see those girls in your class? Irrespective of who they are and what their background is, you respect them. You be cordial to them. And don't let me hear you not doing it. Otherwise, you'll have me to answer to. We need to narrow their focus. We need to hedge them in. So that they know what the boundaries are. To develop and grow. Are you following me, loved ones? I have a friend who had a coach. Who told them that if they were ever late for the bus that, that was scheduled to take them for a game that he would put them on the bench and they wouldn't play. Well, my friend, what happened was one day he overslept and he was late for the bus. So he got his mother to drive him to the game. He got there before the game started. But what did the, 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 um, the coach do? He was the best player on the team, but he missed the bus. So he had to sit on the bench and watch his team lose. Even though he was the star player, he told me he was never late for another game again in his entire career. I love what Dr. Henry Cloud and he helps us says, and he helps us to establish healthy boundaries with our children at various ages and stages. He called them training moments. Here's what he writes: Training moments occur when both parents and children do their jobs. The parents' job is to make the rule. The child's job is to break the rule. The parent then corrects and disciplines. The child breaks the rule again. And the parent manages the consequences and empathy that then turn the rule into reality and internal structure for the child. Henry Cloud, Boundaries with Kids. 
when to say yes, how to say no. He also helps us deal with the temper tantrums we all face when he writes. Other children communicate with actions, such as tantrums. Any of you ever had those parents? Yelling and name calling and running away. The trick is to disallow this form of expression and encourage verbal communication. I want to know what you are feeling, but I want to hear you tell me instead of show me. And lastly, he shares the benefit of these boundaries when raising children. Children raised with good boundaries learn that they are not only responsible for their lives, but also free to live their lives in any way they choose, as long as they take responsibility for their choices. For the responsible adult, the sky is the limit. The second divine deposit we all need to make in the next generation. Here it is. Deposit inspiring vision in the next generation. Notice the next phrase. It doesn't say in the way you want them to go. You notice that? Or in the way you think they should go. It doesn't say in the way you wish you wish you would have went. It says in the way that they should go. Are you seeing that there? Train up a child in the way they should go. That phrase in Hebrew is an idiom meaning in accordance with his way or literally in the mouth of his way. The way you interpret the word way is key. If you interpret it as your way or the only way in a more literal sense, then you could be in danger of pushing your own dreams and pushing your own vision on the next generation. If you interpret it as their way or a way in a more non-literal sense, which is what I believe to be the right way, then you are helping them to discover their own path based on their individual interests, passion, and gifts. That's how the word is interpreted in Proverbs 30, 18, and 19. It says three things are too wonderful for me. The way an eagle is in the sky, the way of a serpent on a rock, and the way of a ship on the high seas. That's why I like the amplified version of the translation. It says, train up a child in the way he should go, and in keeping with his individual gift or bent, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. That's the amplified version. By keeping with his own individual gift or bent, it's acknowledging that each of us is wired differently. We possess various gifts and abilities that all need to be discovered. There are some parents who parent all of their children the same. You can't do that because they're all wired differently. Some are more academic. Some are more athletic. Some are more artistic. Some are more strong-willed or compliant. Some are like to be encouraged by being rewarded and recognized while others can care less. We are all different. When our children were conceived, notice I said conceived. I began praying a few prayers over them, which I still pray over them even up to today. And I like to share some of it with you. So I made a list. I began to pray for their salvation. I began to pray for a growing faith, a saving faith, a persevering faith, that they will be strong and healthy in mind, in body, and in spirit. I pray for desire for integrity for them. I pray for work ethic. I pray for protection. I pray for their future spouses. That was when they were conceived. They weren't even born yet. I prayed for natural academic gifts and abilities. Listen to this. I prayed for natural musical gifts and abilities. And listen, the Lord is answering the prayers. It ain't finished yet, but I am seeing it become a reality. But I didn't want to see my passions become their passions. I want to cultivate and curate their passions. Can you think of people who did that for you?
I remember when my dad did it. I remember when my teacher did it. Oh, Miss Roslyn Peters, Petersville Primary School, thank you for her. God used her tremendously in my life. I remember when my scout leader did it. I remember when my pastor did it. And listen, loved ones, that's what we need to do for the next generation. Deposit inspirational vision in the next generation. Here's the third one. Deposit timeless truths in the next generation. Notice the next phrase, what it says. Even when he is old. No, this is where a lot of people get it mixed up. This is not a guarantee that if you take your children to church and they memorize the Ten Commandments and make and recite the prayers every night before they go to bed, that they will never backslide or lose their way. That's not what this is saying. Are you following me? No. What it is saying is that the timeless truth of God's word can have a lasting impact if you don't neglect it or ignore it. Remember this. A proverb is not a promise to claim, but a principle to follow. Some of you need to write that down. A proverb is not a promise to claim, but a principle to follow. Think of a modern day example. When someone says an apple a day keeps the doctor away, they're not saying that if you eat an apple every day that you're not, you're, you'll never be in need of a doctor. What it is saying is that if you decide to include more fruit in your diet, you can lead a healthier lifestyle. Just like if you faithfully deposit timeless truths into the next generation, then it will be a benefit to their spiritual growth. Are you following me, loved ones? Raising godly children today takes intentionality. The right amount of structure, the right amount of time, the right amount of prayers, encouragement, and affection. Hear us. I want to give you this morning, we're going to be practical. I want to give you seven practical love in action things for you to consider. Remember love, <laughs> remember love is what love does. Here's the first one. Lead your children in family devotions. Five days a week during the school year, we have family devotions. I usually start out our family time. Now that my kids are teenagers, I start out the family time with a life situation. Something in the neighborhood, something from the newspaper, something I read online, a school situation or a general life lesson. Then I read scripture. We, we um, expound on the scripture. We explain it. Then we finish with a prayer. And we make the prayers more than let us have a good day, Lord. We go deep with our prayers. Lead your children in family. We only do it Monday to Friday. We don't do it on weekends. We, we, we scarcely do it when school is on vacation. But Monday to Friday when school is in session, we have family devotions. Here's the next one. I'm just giving you some practical things. You might want to write these down. Establish work boundaries. I failed here immensely in the beginning. To make my family a priority. I had to set up some rules. And I, as I said, I did this wrong at first. But I have tried to correct it. I am home now on most evenings. If you want to lead a balanced life, decide how many hours you want to work and stick to your guns. Put work appointments on your calendar in pencil, but put family commitments in pen. You could do that now electronically. Love is time and time is love. Here's the third thing. Spend time with and date your children. Boy, Odie. I tell you, that one blessed me this morning, boy. I'm like, Odie, what's listen to my sermon? Right? This, this is really good. Spend time with and date your children. Now, I, it is a privilege for me to drive my kids to school. I can't say that at one point, but I could just pay a van and send them. No, no, no. No, I, I state the time. 
because it gives me an opportunity to be able to talk and interact and find out what's going on in life. And I cherish this time with them. When they were younger, I took them on dates. I didn't call them dates. Here's what I call them. Well, uh, for Shari, because she's a girl, daddy-daughter date. For Matthew, can I say date? Daddy-son hangouts is what we call them. And Debbie and I are talking, now that they're teenagers, we want to reintroduce it. Because they still talk about it. But listen, spend time with and date your children. If you're not intentional about this, here's what I have figured out. A whole year can go by without you sharing a single deep conversation with your child. A whole year can pass without you sharing a deep conversation with your child. Here's the fourth one. Pray for and encourage your children with words every day. I realize that my wife and I were probably the only ones who would intentionally be praying for our children every day. I also made it a goal to tell my children regularly, I love you and I am proud of you. Regularly. There's a biblical precedence for this. At both the baptism of Jesus and the transfiguration, God spoke and said, you are my dearly beloved son in whom I am well pleased. In other words, I love you and I am proud of you. Let your children hear those words coming from you on a regular basis. Well, Pastor, I ain't really the softy, softy type of dad, you know. Me, 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 I'm a tough. Really now? That's your excuse? Expose your children to ministry. Participate as a family in as many ministry opportunities offered in our church and they're all over. Serve as a family. Be intentional about it. Serve together. It helps them build confidence in their own faith. Here's the sixth one. Make your children responsible to attend church. Just as it's foolish to let your children skip school. It's foolish to let them skip church. When children are young, they will freely go to church if you go. But as they grow, let that passion and zeal for God's house become theirs. But you have to model it to them when they're young. Are you following me, loved ones? And here's the seventh one. Remember, you hold an awesome power. Right now, your children desperately need to know that someone loves them as they are with their own gifts and abilities. They yearn for someone who will overlook their faults, forgive their sins, and love them without reserve. They hunger for someone who delights and believes in them. They thirst for someone who thinks that they are great, who thinks the best of their motives. Whether they can articulate it or not, they long for someone who will make them feel safe. You are God's designated solution. Are you willing to make that first move, loved ones? Are you willing to do that? Are you willing to keep on pouring in and pressing into your children? Two more divine deposits we need to make in the next generation. Here's the fourth one. Deposit radical reliance in the next generation. Here's what I mean by that. The last phrase of this says he will not depart from it. In order for this to happen, we need to be plugged into the vine. Jesus is the one who introduced this radical reliance and it's right here in scripture. It says, I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. Vine dresser, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. How deep is that? I am the vine. You are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, 
It is he that bears much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. John 15, 1 to 5. Loved ones, I want nothing more than for my children, for their faith to exceed mine. Amen. Helping them to learn and experience what it means to step out in faith. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. 3 John, uh, 3, 3 John 1, 4. So if you desire something, pray for it. And when God blesses you, thank him for it. You are getting the nuggets? My son Matthew's desire was always to go to Marico Secondary School. That was his goal. That was his desire. I heard him pray for it. I heard him cry out to God for it. And even before he began to verbalize it to us. I'm teaching my children to pay, pray big prayers. God-sized prayers. Leaning into and watch God work. As they prepare for college and university. You hear when my brain is gone, right? I encourage them to pray and invite God into that decision. Rather than just asking him for his blessing. So let me ask you, are you teaching the next generation to radically rely on God by radically relying on him yourself? C.S. Lewis said, relying on God has to begin all over again every day as if nothing had yet been done. And here's the last divine deposit we all need to make in the next generation. Deposit everlasting hope in the next generation. How? I want you to look down in chapter 22, verse 17 to 19. It says, incline your ear and hear the words of the wise and apply your heart to my knowledge. For it will be a pleasant, for it will be pleasant if you keep them within you. If all of them are ready on your lips, that your trust may be in the Lord. You hear that? That your trust may be in the Lord. Hope comes when we trust in the Lord, loved ones. And I think the best thing that we can do for the next generation is to invest hope in them. Let me tell you about when I just started my ministry. I was a youth pastor at the Camden Park Baptist Church. I was 17 years old. God led me to begin to invest in just a couple young people in the youth group. The youth group had, when we started, we had about 15 young people. They were all around my age, some of them just a little younger. They said that they were Christians, but they had absolutely no passion for God. I prayed for a couple of them to come to Christ. So that the youth ministry could be turned around and get some new life. That they would be transformed so that they would be able to transform the group. And it began with three of them first. Surrendering their lives to Jesus Christ. And those three became committed, compelled, and contagious. I saw many of them flourish in their faith. And they are leaders in the Vincentian society today. And many of them are leaders in their churches today. One of them is Bernadine's husband, Timothy. We affectionately call him Timo. Timo was a part of my youth group. His wife wasn't in his life then. But God would have it. She's now a worship leader in our church. Another is Kimsha Williams. Who now runs Learning for Living. Kimsha was a part of my youth group. Kimsha now has the opportunity to pour into my children academically. 
What a joy and how proud it is anytime I go over there to pick them up to see where God has brought Kimsha. Another is Natasha Sargent. She's now a leader in her church and a radiologist at the Milton Cato Memorial Hospital. I'm so proud of her. I remember when three of them made the decision to follow Christ. Their personalities and passion changed the dynamic of the whole group. As well as the countless number of people that their lives would have impacted over the years. I share that story to show you that the generational impact that the gospel can bring is immeasurable. Let me ask you as we close. Are you willing to make these divine deposits? Are you willing to make them in the next generation? Dad, are you willing to make it? Irrespective of where your children are at. Remember, we have preached this here before. You still have an obligation to your children. Irrespective of what age you are. So if that's you, dad, I'm going to ask you to stand. I hope all the dads are going to stand now. Let's give these dads a round of applause. Let's encourage them. That must have been all the children clapping. Come on, let's give the dads a round of applause. I want to end with us verbalizing that commitment, so I ask the dads to stand for us. I'm going to ask the rest of you to stand now. And we're going to put this up on the screen. I want you to repeat. Repeat after me. All right, let's go with number one. I am ready and willing. You're going to repeat after me. Follow instructions, please. Do what you're told. No, just kidding. I am ready and willing to invest godly wisdom in the next generation. I am ready and willing to invest inspiring vision in the next generation. I am ready and willing to invest timeless truth in the next generation. I am ready and willing to invest radical reliance in the next generation. I am ready and willing to invest everlasting hope in the next generation.